Good morning, Nicole. All right, I see the Zoom room is filling up. Good morning. Welcome. We are going to be getting started in just a minute. As always, let us know who you are and where you're Zooming in from today. We have a great program for you this morning. We're going to visit with Heather Neary, the president of Auntie Anne's Pretzels. Good to see so many people up with us for another edition of Coffee Hour. Again, let us know who you are and where you're Zooming in from today. And we will be getting started in just a moment. Good morning, Denise from State College. Good to see you. Got Sarah from State College, one of our teammates at the Penn State Alumni Association. Good to see you this morning, Sarah. Dinesh from Capital College. Good to see you, Dinesh. And Ron from Southampton, class of 74. Good morning, Ron. We'll be getting started in just a moment with coffee hour with our guest, Heather Neary. Where else would you rather be than a Zoom full of Penn Staters? Good no. morning, I'm Paul Clifford, CEO of the Penn State Alumni Association, and welcome to our Coffee Hour. We're back for another great edition each week on Coffee Hour. You can expect to hear the voices of Penn Staters talking about what they're passionate about, and you can expect to feel the pride and the power of the Penn State Network. We are recording this session, and closed captions are available for this event. You can find more information in the chat in Zoom or in the comments on Facebook. Today, we are talking with the president of Auntie Anne's Pretzels, Heather Neary. Auntie Anne's is the world's largest soft pretzel franchise firm with more than 1,700 stores operating in 48 states, 30 countries, and 30 countries around the world. Since 2005, Neary has held multiple positions of increasing responsibility at Auntie Anne's before Joining Auntie Anne's, Neary had served as the brand manager for Aselte Corporation in New York after getting her start in San Diego and as a managing editor for Advisor Media. She has been featured in Cosmopolitan, Forbes, and on Fox News and other national networks, where she speaks on such topics as leadership and innovation. Neary continues to be very active, uh, an active member of the Penn State Harrisburg community. She currently serves on the board of advisors at Penn State Harrisburg, as well as the Advisory Council for Penn State Harrisburg School of Business Administration. In 2010, she received the Penn State Alumni Association's Alumni Achievement Award. She was the 2017 Penn State Harrisburg Alumni Achievement Award recipient. And then just last year in 2019, she was named an Alumni Fellow. Heather, welcome to Coffee Hour. Hi, Paul. Good morning. How are you? I am fantastic. I'm so excited to have you on the show. I got, got all prepared. We have the, the nice branded background for Auntie Anne's. I'm, I'm excited to I have love our it. conversation. So let's start right at the beginning. How did you become a Penn Stater? Well, oh gosh, let me think about how I became a Penn Stater. I uh, had moved back to the Pennsylvania area after spending some time in California and New York. I knew I wanted to get my MBA. I looked at a couple of different programs, but you know who doesn't want to be part of the Penn State community? And so I applied at Penn State Harrisburg. I was accepted, and I spent three years working full time and going to school part time at Penn State Harrisburg, and had an incredible experience. And you know that 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 MBA has served me very very well, not only with the networking, but the friends I met there and the education that I received that has helped me continue to grow in my career. So talk about that. What was it like to both work full time at that point you were at 
Auntie Anne's and we're going to get to your great career there. But what was it like to work full time and then go to class as a part time student? Yeah, so I was there back before. I mean, I'm sure there was virtual classes at that point. Um, I think there was a Penn State Global Campus was there, a world campus, but um, I needed that in-person classroom experience for myself. So it was just a lot of schedule man management. Um, I know I went to class, you know, either two or three nights a week, and I commuted from Lancaster to Harrisburg with some classmates that I had met in the program. And I would uh, just try to allocate time and schedule appropriately. I remember spending a lot of Sundays holed up in my dining room um, doing classwork and studying. I know you've talked about this before, um, and, and you have said that Penn State Harrisburg offers all the benefits of the large Penn State network while being more intimate and smaller. You developed some pretty strong relationships with your faculty members while you were there, relationships that continue today and, and continue to help you in your professional life. Can you talk a little bit about those relationships? Yeah, I mean, Penn State Harrisburg has an incredible group of, of uh, faculty that have just been so helpful to me, not only while I was in the program, but as I've grown. Um, Dr. Bloomberg is somebody that I reached out to many times after I finished the program at Penn State. I think he's since retired, but he was an incredible asset to the organization, and it really helped us, uh, really helped me work through some organizational challenges as I grew in my career. Dr. Young, who's also since retired, um, has become a good friend of my husband and I, and he and his wife and I and some of our, our classmates often get together for coffee or dinner to talk about what's happening in the world and where our careers have gone and just to you know enjoy each other's company. And then Dr. Shapey has just been a great, a great person to reach out to, to bounce ideas off of and to, to learn from. It's great to have a, you know, a wide network of people that you can reach out to and Penn State definitely offered that through some faculty members who were super accessible and really willing to share their thoughts and their time with you. So walk us a little bit through your career. You started in San Diego um, as a managing editor in, in the print world, right? And then um, went to New York and you were a brand manager for a large uh, office products company. Was the goal to get into uh, the food industry or was the goal to get back to Lancaster or Kind of when you got started in this, what was what were you looking to do? Paul, I wish I could say I had a, a really um, a clear master plan. The answer would be I did not have a master plan. Um, I ended up in San Diego after I graduated from Millersville University here in Pennsylvania. Um, I graduated on a Saturday and moved with a girlfriend to San Diego on a Monday. And um, I think I had about six hundred dollars in my bank account. I didn't have a job. I did have a car payment and I did have student loans and I figured I had to get a job somewhere. I might as well try San Diego. So off I went. Um, I had worked in the food business all through college as a server and a bartender. So right away when I moved to San Diego, I got a job in that industry um, to make ends meet because obviously you need to be able to support yourself living in a beach community with, with rents that were commensurate with a beach community. Um, right. Got a job pretty quickly working for Advisor Media. It is no longer around, but it was a old school print publication during the dot-com boom of the late 90s. Um, learned a ton there, had some great experiences there, was able to actually use my English degree, um, which I had from Millersville, and um, moved to New York in 2001, a couple of years later. Actually, 2002, moved to New York, 2002. Um, but really didn't love the publishing world, thought I needed a little bit more, a uh, little bit more diversity and experiences. And so I restarted my career in 2002 in New York in the marketing world and had a great experience there, learned a ton. Um, to be honest, when I came to Annie Ann's in 2005, uh, there was, again, no grand plan beyond my husband was going overseas with the military for a year. And I figured I would come home and hang out with my family for a year while he was overseas. And after my year was up, I would move with him to wherever his next duty station was. <laughs> um, so I wish I could say I had a grand plan. I did not have a grand plan, but I, after about six months at Auntie Anne's, my husband and I were talking on the phone one day and I said, this company's just doing some cool things. I'd love to, love to stick around here. And he's like, well, I don't really have a choice of where I go next. And as it turns out, he was able to pull some strings. He got stationed in Quantico, Virginia, and he um, very generously did a long commute, would leave Monday mornings at 4 a.m. and come home Friday afternoons, Friday evenings. Um, 
And that time that he did that allowed me to get my degree at Penn State and grow my career. And then he retired uh, from the Marine Corps in 2010. And we were able to start our you know, second part of our life um, in a post-military world where he um, got a job at the Defense Department and continues to work as a defense contractor. So again, I wish I could say I had a grand plan. I did not have one. I will say I worked really hard along the way and um, I've had a lot of great opportunities at Auntie Anne's. I joined the company shortly after, well, actually Anne was in the process of selling the company when I joined Auntie Anne's and it was just in a period of massive transformation and um, I seized every opportunity I had the advantage of taking and it was, it was great. I've learned a lot. I've worked in all kinds of fields within the Annie Ann's organization. Uh, we were purchased by a larger company in 2010. Um, and I've continued to be able to have tons of great experiences um, in part because of my Penn State degree too. That's amazing. Okay, so we've talked about this before. Our time at Millersville actually overlapped a little. I did a year of graduate work there. But what, what restaurants did you work in? You mentioned that you worked all through college. Um, I, I'd be interested to hear if it was some of the some of the places that I yeah, had stopped Yeah, I worked at, well, both places are no longer in business. I worked at a place called Smoke and Jake's, okay. uh, actually with a bunch of Millersville students. So I worked at Smoke and Jake's, which was like a barbecue joint, um, old right. school blues, booze, and barbecues was our tagline. <laughs> and then... When that restaurant closed, I worked at Tobias, Fo Tobias Frogs briefly, and that's yeah. kind of near the Millersville campus. A lot of Millersville students hang out there. And then I um, finished my serving career at a place called Cafe Chuckles in Lancaster. Um, the owners of that place are still good friends of mine. They've since retired and, and enjoying retirement, but I had some great experiences learning how to serve and bartend and deal with all kinds of people and learn the art of customer service. Absolutely. You know, uh, I, I, we probably shouldn't talk too much about it or else people will start to start to flock to Lancaster um, <laughs> and it won't be one of the best kept secrets, but it's one of the best kind it of foodie is. places uh, in the state of Pennsylvania. A lot of great places there, although the places that I'm going to mention now, are, I would now put on that list. But Jack's was one of my uh, was one of my stops there right off campus on Millersville. And then there was this great place called Carlos and Charlie's. Yeah, um, Carlos and, and Charlie is no longer with us either, but lots of yes. great restaurants. And I'll tell you, when I moved back to Lancaster in 2005, I was shocked by how the restaurant scene had just exploded. And there's incredible restaurants here that, you know, would really be a surprise to anybody who doesn't know the Lancaster area. Absolutely. So you and I have talked before about the corporate culture uh, at Auntie Anne's. And as, as the president, I'm sure that's something that you probably spend a lot of your time thinking about. Kind of how would you describe your corporate culture there? Um, you know, I think culture is really about every single person buying into the vision of the organization. And, and we're really fortunate to have a founder who's still with us. Um, and she really established a culture of caring for other people and giving back in the community. And I think we've been able to continue that since um, she left in 2005. It's a big part of who we are. Giving back is a big part of our business. It's always been something that's been a focus for me personally since I was a kid, quite frankly. Um, and our culture is one of giving back. It's one of um, taking care of each other. We have a lot of fun together. I think we you know, live by the mantra of work hard, play hard. And we're just a big family. Like there's very few people that work at Auntie Anne's that I don't already know personally, their spouses, their children, um, you know, their life story. And that's really what makes us, it makes it all so special. We spend a lot of time at work and working that, you know, you've got to like the people you work with and we all, we all have a lot of fun together. So it, it's interesting um, throughout the history of your company, essentially, it's been, it's been women led, right? Uh, Talk, talk a little, and, and I don't want to talk about politics, but we've seen some kind of glass ceiling shattering uh, events over the past week, right? Um, but you were breaking that ceiling uh, for a lot of women uh, well before what happened uh, this past week. Do you, do you feel, talk about the, the kind of the responsibility or the, um, uh, or kind of your position as a, as a role model for, for younger women who aspire to be where you are? Yeah, it's a great question. And actually, uh, you know, Anne was the founder and she was the leader of the company from 1988 when it founded until 2005 when she left. But we had two presidents after that at Auntie Anne's who were not women. Okay. And when I became president in 2015, 
uh, Anne and I were talking one day and she said, oh, I'm so glad to see another woman back in that role. And I think, you know, um, I've been so fortunate to have so many strong women role models in my life. My mom is one, my grandmother is one, um, as well as in my career. I've had a lot of women I've worked for who have really um, led by example. They've been mentors to me. They've been sponsors for me. They've been advisors for me. They've um, corrected me when I've done things that I shouldn't do or said things that I shouldn't say. Um, and they've also shown me that, you know, being a woman in the workplace is, is, is a responsibility that I take seriously. I think it's important to bring along lots of people with me. And I think, you know, Auntie Anne's is now part of Focus Brands. And we have a lot of women in leadership roles within Focus Brands. We have, uh, Kat Cole is an incredible, incredible um, leader within the Focus Brands organization, but then within the restaurant industry as a whole, she has an incredible story. And she really leads by example as well as our chief operating officer of this entire huge organization. Focus Brands is made up of seven great brands, Carvel, Cinnabon, Auntie Anne's, Jamba Juice, McAllister's Deli, Moe's Southwest Grill, and Schlotsky's Deli. And we have Kat Cole at the helm leading most of us through a lot of this crazy stuff that's happened this year. So I think, you know, being a woman in this role, um, there's certainly challenges. There's challenges in any role. I try not to rely too heavily on that, but I think it's a responsibility that we all have as women growing in our roles to re recognize that it's our responsibility to bring other women with us. Um, we just brought on a new VP of marketing and I'm, we, we hired a woman. We interviewed multiple candidates, but at the end of the day, there was a woman who was most qualified. And I think that's exciting for all of us to know that we continue to value diversity within the Focus Brands organization and especially within Auntie Anne's. So um, as we moved into 2020, uh, Auntie Anne's was humming along, right? New franchises. You just opened a franchise on College Avenue here uh, in State College. I, I remember, I know how excited you were to have that location, uh, expecting a big football, uh, big football season in 2020. But those plans were put on hold in March. Uh, talk a little bit about the impact that COVID-19 has had on your company and how you've led your company through that, through this period. Yeah, it's, I mean, yeah, I mean, I remember Paul, I had on my calendar a reminder to have a Carvel cake delivered to you for your birthday this past spring, which didn't <laughs> right. happen because we weren't open then. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I'm going to get you next year though. You, I'm you, a you, big you, fan you, of uh, Fudgy the Whale, so. Exactly. Yeah. I remember you mentioned that. So I have that reminder on my calendar. Unfortunately, we weren't open, but. Um, right. You know, COVID has hit every industry really hard. There's no industry that's been spared, really. Um, you know, Auntie Anne's is a franchise organization. So we're made up of small business owners around the country. And it's just been really, it's been a tough year. I mean, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna lie. You know, we are, 57% um, of our stores are in enclosed malls. And we had no control over when those enclosed malls closed down. And in many right. cases, we didn't even have access to our stores for, four, six, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 weeks. And when the stores reopened, because the malls were allowed to reopen, we were faced with capacity limitations put on by the government to keep people, you know, as safe and comfortable as possible. Um, so really as an organization, we, um, you know, I'll, I'll use that cliche word of pivot, <laughs> but um, we really pivoted um, extremely quickly. We had already planned to launch online ordering this year. Um, we already did have third-party delivery in place. I can see behind you, there's a DoorDash logo. Um, so we already had third-party delivery in place, in place across our organization. But the online ordering got ramped up a lot quicker. And that has been a great addition to our organization. Um, we did some online e-commerce things where you could order a DIY kit and have those delivered to your home. And it was a fun activity for you to do with your kids. Um, and we had also, you know, three years ago, we were in 80% enclosed malls. At the beginning of 2020, we were at 57% enclosed malls. We had already been making a significant effort to move outside of that mall space, to move out of that side of that retail space as consumer habits and consumer desires have shifted. Um, the location on College Avenue is a great example of us continuing to grow outside of our mall space. We opened at the beginning of 2020. We were really excited about that location. It was doing really, really well for us. Um, we had to close when COVID hit, obviously. We've reopened um, and we're continuing to grow outside of the mall space. 
um, in many locations around the country, whether it's amusement parks or street side locations. We've got a drive through happening. It's a co-brand with Jamba Juice. That'll be opening shortly in Atlanta. Um, there's lots of desire for the Auntie Anne's brand. Our challenge is finding locations that make sense for us where people are going to be and how, how their habits are changing, especially given COVID. So you're, um, you're a marketer at heart, right? You, you like to, to tell stories and kind of tell the story of your brand. And I think of your locations, right? I think of in train stations and, and airports and malls, like you just said, um, where I, and, and I don't know your industry as well as you do, but I would think that some of those purchases are impulse buys, right? How do you build, uh, how do you use marketing to kind of build uh, a mindset amongst customers or build the habits, right? Like when I go to the mall, it's part of our family tradition that we're going to get Auntie Anne's pretzels, right? Uh, talk about your marketing strategy and, and how you try to build um, kind of consistency in your customer base. Yeah, I think for a lot of our consumers, um, you know, what they tell us is that they love our brand, they love our pretzels, they crave our pretzels. The biggest challenge they face is that they don't come to Auntie Anne's as much as they used to because they don't go to malls as much as they used to. Right. So that's where we come into play with DoorDash, Uber Eats, Grubhub, our own online app where you can order from the Auntie Anne's app from your phone and have it delivered to your front door, which I will tell you, working from home, I do it all the time. I'll be in a meeting where we're talking about some of our pretzels or I'll see pictures like you have behind you and I'm like, I've got to have a pretzel. And I regularly order from my phone to have delivered to my house and it's super easy. So from a marketing perspective, it's really about getting that communication out. When consumers figure out that they can order from our app and have pretzels delivered hot and fresh to their front door, they are over the moon excited. And that category for us has continued to grow since we launched it in June. It will continue to be a big growth factor for us moving forward. And it's all about staying in front of the consumer. It's about digital advertising. It's about a social media presence. And it's about making consumers aware that they can enjoy their favorite Auntie Anne's pretzels and lemonade at home, just like they used to in the mall space. So I, I remember a conversation that we had back when you were on campus uh, almost a year ago. And we were talking about our, our favorite locations, right? I talked about the one that I stop at when I drive out to Michigan State, you just come across the border there in Ohio. And Randy Houston, who's our president, was talking about the one that he goes by, um, I believe it was in uh, Port Terminal uh, in, in New York City. And what, what struck me was you seem to know every one of your, your franchise locations. Like, you know, okay, that one's owned by, and uh, it, so it, 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 was, it was kind of um, refreshing that the president of the company was, was so hands-on. Talk about, you know, the relationship that you have with your franchisees. It seems like you're in conversations with your franchisees more than one might expect a president of a company to be. Yeah, I mean, I think it goes back to our culture, Paul. I mean, at the end of the day, we're made up of a lot of small business owners all over the country. And I have, you know, always had the, the philosophy that communication is critical. And in the absence of communication, people make stuff up. Right. I use a different word than stuff sometimes, but it's the morning. So we'll, we'll, we'll keep it PG for now. It's a, fam it's a family um, show. Right? It is a family show. But I think at the end of the day, um, letting folks know that they can reach out to me if they're not getting their problem solved by somebody else is really important. Um, I grew up in the organization. So for 10 years before I became president, I was working with franchisees all the time, whether it was in marketing roles or operations roles. And I got to know them. I got to know their families. I got to know their, you know, their, their spouses and their stories and how they came into the brand and why they're so passionate about Auntie Anne's. And that's what makes me love the organization so much. And that's what leads me to say to you, like when you talk about locations, you know, I don't know every location right. um, off the top of my head, but I usually have a good sense of who owns which locations and which parts of the country and, and, you know, our franchisees are really the ones that make the magic happen every day. We're a franchisor, so we can't be in every store every day. We have to make sure our franchisees are 100% invested in the business, engaged in the business, bought into the business, because they're the ones that deliver that awesome customer service to our guests every day. So that responsibility that falls on us corporately to deliver great customer service to them so they can in turn deliver that to our guests at the storefront. So I was just, I, I love how your company is is based in Lancaster, right? It's a Pennsylvania based company, um, but you all have a, a, a local impact there as well. I was talking with 
uh, a friend of mine, Jim Hanna, who's the uh, one of the leaders of corporate social responsibility for Microsoft. What would you say uh, kind of makes up your corporate social responsibility plan at Auntie Anne's? Yeah, so I think I mentioned this earlier, but one of our big philosophies is giving back. Um, Anne had a great saying that she lived by that we've continued to honor. It's to give, to get, to give again. So our main philosophy in our business is giving back. And I will say that, you know, the reason Anne started Auntie Anne's Pretzels, not to go too far off, but it's a relevant story to what you asked. Um, Anne and her husband lost a child to an accident when she was 18 months old. And that was long before Auntie Anne's was founded, but it really threw them into a tailspin in terms of the grief they were feeling and experiencing. And they, um, they went to a counselor. They went to you know, a marriage counselor, a, a life counselor to talk about the grief they were feeling. And they felt like going to this counselor really helped to save them, helped to save their marriage, helped to save their life. And um, they grew up Amish Mennonite. And in that community, as in many communities, seeking help for mental health issues is a challenge. So um, Jonas, Anne's husband, came out of this experience and wanted to give back in the community that they lived in. So he wanted to become a counselor himself. In order for him to pursue this dream of counseling, Anne had to go back to work. And she actually purchased a farmer's market stand in Downingtown, Pennsylvania in 1988. It sold a number of things. It sold pretzels, pizza, sandwiches, ice cream, lemonade. Um, and she was really just doing it to fund her husband's vision to give back to the community, to help other folks that were suffering from typical uh, other issues that they were experiencing. And so the company was literally founded on the premise of giving back and we wanna to continue to honor that. We have our own in-house cares committee, which is a 501c3 organization that gives money back in the community. Our, our annual golf tournament raises close to $200,000 every summer, giving back to local charities and then also our national charitable partner. And then to take it one step further, a lot of our franchisees, actually most of our franchisees uh, give back as well. And one of the reasons they bought into the brand was our philosophy of giving back and their desire to give back in their communities. So our national charitable partner is Alex's Lemonade Stand Foundation, which is actually headquartered outside of Philadelphia and Paula Kinwood. And we've donated more than $5 million to them over the years through, through in-store campaigns, through corporate initiatives, et cetera. And um, I actually serve on the advisory board for Alex's, and I think it's a great organization that's working to solve and find a cure for pediatric cancer. So I think the, the whole mentality of giving back is something that we all live and breathe every day. It's not a once a year event. Um, we do things throughout the year. We do, typically we do Mother's Day gifts to women in, in homeless shelters. Um, we give back to the Police Athletic League in Lancaster, where we um, help to support their athletic programs to keep kids off the streets after school and in more constructive uh, structured activities. Uh, we also give back to Power Packs, which provides food to children over the weekends. And then we also support lo the local food bank in Lancaster too, because you know the, the issue of food insecurity has only heightened during this pandemic. And you know, I've always been very fortunate to not have those needs, but I recognize that not everybody is as fortunate I, as, as I am. So I think it's super important for us to, to live our values every day. And we, we really work hard at that and make it a central focus of who we are. This is the Penn State Alumni Association's Coffee Hour. I'm Paul Clifford. This morning, I'm joined by the president of Auntie Anne's and the 2019 Penn State Alumni Fellow, Heather Neary. Heather, giving back though, doesn't just stop for you in the corporate sense, right? You serve on uh, a number of advisory boards at Penn State Harrisburg. What drives you to continue to give back to your alma mater in that way? Um, well, I think it's just, it's just been ingrained in me. My parents um, have always been very heavily involved in giving back to others. I know um, I'll, I'll tell you a little bit of a funny story. It was uh, the summer between seventh and eighth grade. And my mom said, you're not sitting in the house all summer. I wasn't old enough to get a job yet a paying job yet. So I went to the, um, the guidance counselor at school and they had this volunteer setup thing happening. And I ended up volunteering that entire summer for the American Cancer Society. And I learned a ton about volunteering and I felt good to give back to those less fortunate than I was. Um, the very next summer I volunteered at Meals on Wheels and delivered food to, to shut-ins who didn't have the opportunity to get out of their houses. And so giving back has always been a focus. My parents instilled that in me. Um, my mom's a retired teacher. My father's a retired police officer who continues to volunteer in the community. Um, 
I think from our perspective, giving back is just who we are and how we operate. And I think being able to help others the way I've been helped throughout my career is an important piece of, of what I do and why I do it. Um, you know, my schedule's busy. I can find a lot of excuses, but you know, the only excuse is, is the ones I make up for myself. So I think it's important to give back. I think it's important to recognize that I didn't get where I am by myself. And it's important that I need to continue to offer that to others as well. Absolutely. All right. On coffee hour, we like to have a little bit of fun. So we're going to uh -oh. do our lightning round here. So I'm going to throw a couple quick questions at you. First thing that pops to mind. So first, your favorite Penn State memory. My favorite Penn State memory. I mean, it has to be football games, right? I mean, those right. are the best things ever. Hanging out with a bunch of friends in the fields, enjoying, you know, some cocktails and great food and then going in to watch Penn State play football. It's an incredible experience. How about your favorite class at Penn State? Probably organizational behavior. I think thinking about the way people work and the way people think and the way people operate um, helps me to be a better leader. And that was probably one of my favorite classes. All right, your favorite Auntie Anne's menu item. Gotta go with an original pretzel and cheese sauce. Okay. Um, if you could have dinner with anyone, who would it be and why? Mm. Just one person? Yes, a non-family member. Um, I think I would choose Nelson Mandela. Okay. And I'll tell you why. I um, had a chance to read his autobiography about a year or so ago, and I've continued to be um, really moved by what he did and how much he sacrificed in his own personal life for a greater cause. And I think that's really enviable and honorable, and I'd love to just pick his brain and figure out, you know, how he got to the thought processes he did. How about your favorite Penn State sport? Football. Yeah. And your favorite flavor of creamery ice cream? I'm an old school vanilla girl. Okay. Original pretzels, vanilla ice cream. I'm pretty plain. <laughs> I have a couple, you know, I've been thinking about a couple of ideas that I was going to pitch to you for Auntie Anne's. And uh, it seems like there would be a magical combination between Penn State creamery ice cream and Auntie Anne's pretzels, maybe. Salty sweet. Nuggets. That'd be a good combo. Yeah. Yeah, we, we, we might have to call. work on something like that. I'm down for that. So, Heather, thank you so much for joining us here on Coffee Hour. Uh, I greatly appreciate you sharing your Penn State story with everybody. And uh, please know your, your life has certainly swelled thy fame of, of dear old state. And for that, we're truly grateful. Thank you. It's been great talking with you. Absolutely. And I, I would be remiss if I didn't say um, thank you and your husband for, for your service uh, to our country uh, on Veterans Day, a day where we honor our veterans. Uh, that was a, a poignant piece of your story that you shared with us. And I wanted to recognize not only the sacrifice of our service members, but their, their family members too that make a tremendous sacrifice. So thank you all for your service. Thanks. I'll pass that on to him as well. Absolutely. And thank you all for joining us on another edition of Coffee Hour. We greatly appreciate you tuning in. Thanks for all you do for the university, for the glory, and for the future. We are Penn State. <laughs>